I ask that the board members of the neighborhood associations and the commissioners of the crime prevention district stand, as I mentioned, your neighborhood. From west to east, they are Lakeview, Lakeshore, Lake Vista, Lake Terrace, and Lake Oaks. This is also the first public event of the recently formed Lake Area Advisory Council. And I've asked Brian Anderson, the chair of the advisory committee, to just say a couple words about what it is. Brian is the chair of the Lakeview, or Lakeview Crime Prevention District, a board member of the Lakeview Civic Improvement Association, and he chairs the advisory committee. Thank you, Dennis. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, it's extremely encouraging to see all these faces out here, especially on a night when it's raining. Um, as Dennis said, the Lake Area Advisory Council is made up of representatives from Lakeview, Lake Vista, Lake Shore, Lake Oak, and Lake Terrace neighborhoods. Together we represent over 15,000 households and many, many more registered voters. I could go up here for the, and tell you a little bit about our mission statement, but I can tell you we meet monthly, we discuss things that are going on in the Lake Area neighborhood, but that's what we do, not why we're here. We're here tonight because for far too long, New Orleans residents have sat idly by and watched elected officials bankrupt our city, both morally and economically. The result of the continuous reckless behavior had led to unsafe, unnavigable, and at times undrainable neighborhoods. And to emphasize my point tonight, we have another word, undrinkable. These are the things that we deal with on a regular basis. This trend must stop, and the Lake Area Advisory Council is ready to be at the forefront of that battle. I'm here tonight to let everyone know we are organized, we are motivated, and most of all, we are fed up. We have the numbers. We have the numbers, our voices will be heard, and we will continue to work together to effect a positive change in local government. Thank you. I know you're not here to hear me or other people like us. You want to hear the candidates, but let's just a few thank yous. First to the Hellenic Center, providing the space that we can all fit in. In order to provide some of the equipment like the sound system, uh, we have three sponsors, Design Engineering, Lamarck Ford, and Linfield Hunter and Junius. Uh, the, those companies all have people living in our neighborhoods, and they provided the sound for that, for the water, and a few other things that came up. To, <clears throat> We also want to thank John Georges. Uh, John is involved in this church, it's his church community, but we went to John to ask if the advocate would be interested in partnering with us. They've stepped up big time. They're the sponsor of the event. Uh, we met with Peter Kovacs, the editor who is here tonight with us, the editor of The Advocate, both New Orleans and Baton Rouge. As I said, they're live, live streaming this event. Um, they're, they provided expertise about the event, and they provided some of the water. Um, <clears throat> let me just ask elected officials that are here, I won't introduce you individually, but could elected officials here stand up just to be recognized? I know we have some appointed officials, commissioners and things, are appointed officials here? Okay, finally, what we really want to do, let me introduce our moderator. Not only did the advocate provide all the technology and advertising, but they asked, they provided us with our moderator. Stephanie Grace, you probably all know from her political columns in the New Orleans Advocate, and she will be our moderator this evening. Stephanie? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, and thank you all for coming. Wow, look at all of you. <laughs> thank you all for coming. This is great. What a great turnout um, for a really important election that's just a few weeks away. So 
Uh, we're going to start off asking each of the six candidates here to introduce themselves, tell you a little about themselves. Uh, they're going to take 90 seconds to do that. And as you can see, they're not in alphabetical order. Tommy Vassell usually is last. Now he gets to go first. <laughs> so congratulations to you, mixing it up a little. Uh, we'll start with um, Mr. Tommy Vassell. Thank you, Stephanie. Good evening. My name is Tommy Vassell. I'm a candidate for mayor. Number 47 is my number. Many of you guys have never seen me before because I've been limited in the discussion. So I want to first of all thank this group here for inviting me to participate because there have been so many groups that have not included me in the contest. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. I am by far the most qualified candidate for this job. I have a record of public service. Uh, that's giving back time in this, community, in this community volunteering, whether it be chairman of the Catholic Charities Organization, working with Junior Achievement, working with the United Way. I have a list of organizations that I've served in volunteering for free. But in addition to that, I'm a certified public accountant, 36 years of experience, nationally recognized. So when we talk about all the issues that we'll be talking about tonight, it's all about the money. And I'm the only candidate in this race that has ever prepared a budget that will actually benefit you, the citizens. Secondly, the biggest issue going on right now is not crime. It's just what the gentleman said, sewage and water board. I served there for nine years. Six of those years was when everything in this area was devastated. I brought it back. The, mayor, may, the current mayor broke it all. I got off the board in 2011, and he broke it. Elect me your mayor, and I'll fix it again. Thank you. Next, we have former uh, Civil District Court Judge Michael Bagneris. My name is Michael Bagneris, and I want to serve you as your next mayor. I want to create a city that's safe, livable, and well-run for our families. I believe that my background, my education, and my experience demonstrates that I'm capable of achieving that end. I was born in humble beginnings. I was born in Charity Hospital. I was raised in the Desire Housing. My mother was a domestic, and my family, my father rather, was a janitor, although he liked to be called a custodian. I was indicated to by both parents that honesty and hard work is how you achieve. I worked hard. I worked and swept floors at grammar school in order to pay for my tuition. I won a scholarship to St. Augustine High School. I won a scholarship to Yale University, where I was a double major. And I matriculated at Tulane Law School and graduated from Tulane Law School. I became the executive counsel of Dutch Morial, our first black mayor. In that capacity, I helped maneuver the city's bill through the legislature, and I have served as chief judge of civil district court, and I sat on that bench for 20 years. I'm the only candidate that has executive, legislative, and judicial experience. I want to use that experience and knowledge to serve you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And next we have uh, Mr. Troy Henry. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I would ask you to refer to my bio sheet or my website, TroyHenry.com, if you want my background. I want to spend a little bit of time introductory-wise explaining to you that the mayor of New Orleans is the CEO of the second largest employer in the city, in Orleans Parish. It is, has over 3,000 employees, over a billion-dollar capital and operating budget. It has a number of complex enterprises to it. It also has unions and non-unions associated with it and a budget of over a billion dollars between capital and operating. When you look at my credentials, it's very simple. I've run and managed organizations much larger than 1,000 employees. I believe I'm the only one that's done that up here. I've hired executives. I've run large businesses today. I own a large business, one of the largest African-American-owned businesses in the country today. I've managed unions. I've actually, actually migrated jobs to cities in the past, and I believe the city of New Orleans needs to grow. 
I've also delivered municipal services. I ran water systems throughout this country in areas like Jacksonville, Florida, Atlanta, Georgia, Laredo, Texas, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, San Antonio, Texas. I actually have also developed and fixed leaky pipes. Okay? I've fixed potholes before, right? I've actually developed a, or redeveloped a neighborhood post-Katrina, Train Park, when it was the second slowest return rate neighborhood in this, in this area. I've actually also designed the energy efficiency program that you now use today called Energy Smart. I am prepared. This is an executive job. This is the executive branch of government, and I am prepared as the executive to run and manage this city. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And next we have a former municipal court judge, Desiree Charbonnet. Good evening, fellow citizens of the great city of New Orleans. I'm Desiree Charbonnet, and I want to be your next mayor. I'm born and raised in New Orleans, went to uh, Cabrini High School, Loyola University for undergrad, and law school. I've served for 20 years as an elected official citywide, first as your recorder of mortgages, where I, during the storm I recovered the books in six weeks because I knew you needed your records available quickly so that you could rebuild your lives. Record time, one of the first public offices to reopen after the storm. I then ran for judge at municipal court, where the majority of that time was as the chief judge. And as a chief judge, I created programs that diverted nonviolent offenders away from the criminal justice system, saving you taxpayer money. I have the executive level experience that has prepared me to take on this office. Now, crime is the issue of the day. I know that we had a boil water advisory today, but crime is what scares us. I am the only candidate that has dealt with crime on a day-to-day -day basis for the last 10 years, day in and day out. I have seen what happens when people have no options and when they have poor educational foundations. I have a plan to change all of that. I have prepared myself all of my life for this job. I have a home in Lake Terrace. While I do represent the entire city, I particularly understand the needs of those in the Lake area. I am endorsed by the district attorney. I'm endorsed by the AFL-CIO. I have crossover vote. I've been endorsed by the Republican Party as well as the Democratic Party. I think that is a good reflection on how I can work well with others. Okay, thank you. And next we have City Councilwoman Latoya Cantrell. Thank you and good evening. My name again is Latoya Cantrell. I've been serving on the New Orleans City Council since 2012 and reelected without opposition in 2014. My background is from the grassroots community organizing. While working pre-Katrina to restore and reform public education, I was very much in involved in the community. Post-Katrina, leading my neighborhood in Broadmoor as the president, while working a full-time job still with education, I led the citizens' fight to save Broadmoor, which was, which was the catalyst for reform citywide. I have been a voice for the people. I've been accessible, accountable, responsible, and I have delivered results every step of the way. I want to serve you as your next mayor to ensure that our people receive hope, protection, and the opportunities that they deserve. I have the vision to lead, the courage to stand up, and the compassion to care about our people. I've demonstrated my commitment to the city of New Orleans and to all of our citizens. I'm unwavering in my love for our city, and I know that I can hit the ground running. No training wheels needed. I've been delivering results. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll finish up with Mr. Frank Skurlock. Thank you. I'm Frank Skurlock. I'm number 44 on the ballot. I'm a local native New Orleans from here. I kind of accidentally ended up running for mayor because I wanted to do something good for this city. Um, I raised three kids here, and my father invented a product called Spacewalk, the inflatable bouncy ride, that I took from New Orleans to over 200 locations nationwide. Along the way, I had the opportunity to move to Orlando. I lived there 10 years, and I returned here in 2010. And when I came back here, I was looking at an opportunity to develop Six Flags out in New Orleans East, so I assembled a team to possibly purchase a joint venture with the city in that. Sadly, the city never took me serious, and I couldn't believe that with such an opportunity to not only enhance the city, but to take care of some of the issues. So I threw my hat in the race. I'm not a politician. I'm a businessman. I'm an entrepreneur. So what separates me from the rest of my friends up here, I have no agenda but to be a servant to the people. 
I believe in this city. We've come from so many tragedies along the way, have it be Katrina or the floodings or the sewage and water board. We can be resolvent and make the, the city work. But one thing has to happen. It has to be transparent from the top down. And that's one of the things right now, for some reason, we all get taxed, we all pay fees, and quite frankly, we don't know where it goes. We have to turn the city upside down, figure it out so we can enjoy and live it. But most importantly, we have to grow because currently with our budget, it doesn't work. And so the only way to make it work for the residents and for City Hall is to grow. And my whole platform is on entrepreneurism and letting the world have trust in New Orleans. Okay, great. Thank you all. Um, we're going to move on to questions now. I should say these are um, topic areas that were chosen by the neighborhood organizations sponsoring this event. Uh, each, uh, for this first round of questions, each candidate will have one minute to, um, to respond. And we're going to start with Michael Bagneris. And we are going to start with infrastructure because today seems as good a day as any to talk about the sewage and water board, right? Um, so here we go. Uh, Judge Bagneris, in 2013, the state legislature and New Orleans voters approved major changes in how the Sewage and Water Board is governed, including removing three city council members from the board. Do you think the current governance structure needs to be changed? And would you consider seeking the required voter approval for any large-scale privatization? Well, the answer to the last part of the question is a definite no. We should not ever privatize our water. Water is the essence of life. I think that would be crazy to privatize it. Now, what I do believe is that we should not have a new jerk, knee jerk reaction to the August 5th flood and all of the other problems that have ensued. I would bring in unbiased eyes, eyes like from the National Regulatory Research Institute or the American Water Work Association, national organizations which are existing to help cities that deal with water distribution. I would ask them to give us some recommendations, some options as it relates to not only the government, the governance structure, the, uh, the positions, the qualifications for the positions, and whether we should start to get rid of the present system that we have, equipment that we have. Unbiased eyes, let's get the options and let's make the choice. That was exactly one minute. Very good. Uh, Mr. Henry. The Sewage and Water Board today is a mess. I would ask you to go to TroyHenry.com. I released a, a re Sewage and Water Board revitalization plan, and I would encourage you to download it and look at it. The changes that need to be made at Sewage and Water Board are threefold. One is at a structural level. There needs to be professionals on the board. Currently today, there is nobody on the board with any level of subject matter expertise at all. We need to hire an executive. Don't eat into my time. We, don't, we need to hire an executive with professional experience. Third of all, we need to actually have individuals that know what they're doing. We have to deploy performance management at every level of the organization, top to bottom. When I ran water systems all over the country, I had a dashboard, and I could tell you what was working in every single city that I was running today. And they can't tell you how many pumps are running today. We have to, technical side, we have to migrate away from 25 cycle power. We need a barrel management so that all of these barrels that are all around the city, nobody should have a barrel in front of their house more than 21 days. You know, we need to also um, um, do main replacements. Most cities' main replacements are every 50 years. We've got 140-year-old okay. pipes that are in our ground today. Thank you. Thank you. And very quickly, yes or no, consider privatization? It's a portion of sewage and water, but it's already privatized. The wastewater is already being run by U.S. filters. So, okay. it's, you know, so the question further. is, do you keep the contractors? Is that what the or question further, is? Further privatization. Uh, I don't think that's necessary with me okay. as mayor. Okay. okay. Judge Charbonnet. No, no to privatization. Um, the other question was about the structure. Pardon me. I'm sorry. About the governance. Is the current governance structure okay or does it need to be changed? It absolutely needs to be changed. First of all, we should have a licensed professional engineer running the sewage and water board. It seems like it would be common sense, but apparently it is not. So we absolutely have to, when we change the sewage and water board, have a licensed professional engineer. The question about its structure, I didn't mean to have such emphasis on my statement, but the structure right now, and the entire board ought to be a majority of engineers, but I believe that we lost something when we, when we removed them from the, count, from the board. 
city council people are your voice. They are your advocates, and they are going to be there to represent your interests. Some people thought it politicized it, but now I think we realize that we probably should have had at least one council person there who can represent the public's interests. Now, the Sewage and Water Board, is the, 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 uh, the emperor has no clothes. We now know all the problems. It needs to be fixed. What I see is an advantage, an opportunity now to make great changes. This is a chance for us to start from the bottom up, change it completely, and present something new, something that we feel good about, something that we can feel secure about, not worry about whether the pumps are Thanks. on. Thank you. Uh, Council Member more Cantrell? Uh, in regards to the first portion about the city council members being on the Sewage and Water Board, uh, since they were taken off right in 2013, uh, I do not see the presence of a city council member could have impacted the existing conditions that we do have within the Sewage and Water Board. It has been mismanaged for decades, and it really does need to be improved. Leadership, absolutely, on the operational side, core skilled and professional engineers, those who have core competencies and skill sets in terms of water management, engineering, hydrology, you name it. In regards uh, to the Sewage and Water Board itself, the governing structure, uh, I believe that, one, we need to ensure that people who are appointed to the board and recommended have the skill sets, again, t of drainage, engineering, construction, sewer, water. That hasn't happened yet. We need to make sure that those appointing authorities are very clear about the legislation requirements about the skills that are needed. Privatization, absolutely not think that it will impact the city of New Orleans far greater to connect our people to those jobs and opportunity as it stands. Thank you. Mr. Skurlock. We certainly should not privatize the Sewage and Water Board. There has to be very clear lines that that is a city responsibility, just like streets are, sewage, and the water and other services. What does need to be privatized is competent inspectors to come in totally re review the whole system because right now everything is a knee jerk. It's a knee jerk for the electricity for there. It's a knee jerk for the quality of water. It's a knee jerk for the catch basin. I don't know anything at the Sewage and Water Board that's not a knee jerk. And so we need to get serious. We need to get some independent outside inspectors, have them come in and do a thorough plan on how to restore it, not just for a day or a two, but we need to set up for the future. And that's one of the things right now. We keep throwing immediate money to, quick, to fix something. We, 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 we brought in generators. Today, it was a generator failure, which led to us having a contamination issue with the water. So we don't need to do a knee jerk, but we need to find somebody to come in and inspect. Thank you. And finally, Mr. Vassell. I hope you guys don't mind because I'm about as thin as that pole, so I want to make sure you guys see me. Uh, <clears throat> let, let me just say that, first of all, we don't want to privatize the sewage and water board, and I'll tell you why. When I was on the board, I went to Washington, D.C. and brought back $650 million for the sewage and water board from FEMA. And we repaired everything at that board that was damaged during Katrina. Otherwise, FEMA would not have reimbursed us that money because of, it's a cost reimbursement program. Secondly, when we talk about the structure of the Sewage and Water Board, from 2002 until 2011 when I was on the board, we had engineers, but they were, we had an engineer who was also a former Corps of Engineers uh, worker. We also had CPAs, we had bankers, so we had a legitimate board. We don't want a board with all engineers, and I'll tell you why. Engineers come and do contracts with the Sewage and Water Board, so you can't work at the Sewage and Water Board and be on the board. So that's why you're not going to get a bunch of en engineers on the board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, staying on the same topic, and we're going to start with Mr. Henry this time. The Sewage and Water Board has estimated that it will need $55 million in new annual revenue to pay for its portion of major, of major drainage projects. Excuse me. Do you support the creation of stormwater fees for this purpose, or do you have other ideas to generate money for this obligation? Sewage and Water Board has no credibility on any of their economic estimates at all. I've run enough water systems to know that it is a shot in the dark what they're estimating. What needs to be done is a top-down restructure of the Sewage and Water Board from its governance level to its regulatory level. Today, the City Council has the regulatory authority to oversee the Sewage and Water Board. 
they should put in place service levels agreements and they have budgetary control just like you manage and regulate any other utility. But because it's a municipal operation, the city council abdicated its responsibility. They don't need to be on the board. You can't be a fiduciary and be a regulator. So the answer is, is that there is so much waste, mismanagement, and graft inside of the Sewage and Water Board. Before I would ever think about asking the citizens of, the, of New Orleans, they haven't done a technical performance evaluation. It's a mess in there. I wouldn't dare ask you for more money until I get my house in order. And it's nowhere near in order. But under my regime, it will be. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Judge Charbonnet. Absolutely no new fees. You are paying enough fees as it is. We are feed out. We need to start learning how to deal with stormwater management in different ways. I only have a minute, so I'm not going to talk about that very long, but I want you to know that there's creative ways, innovative ways that people are dealing with stormwater management, and we cannot continue to just pump water out to the, to the lake right now. It is just changing. We've got to have other ways. Now, about how we're going to pay for this. We have so many new developments coming online where you don't have to pay another fee. We are going to re re uh, receive taxes from the uh, World Trade Center. That is going to be a world-class hotel. There's a lease payment paid to the city for that. We're going to have sales tax, property taxes from that. Above the, ho the hotel will be condominiums. So you're going to have separate properties above that building, above the hotel, that are all going to each generate property taxes. Those are the early estimates are $13 million that we're going to start learn earning from that. That's just the beginning. Now, don't even talk about some other options that are coming online. We're going to use the new money that we're going to have so that you don't pay any more fees. Enough. Thank you. Council Member Cantrell. Thank you. The estimated $50 million is one portion, but soon on a bond, we're going to have to start paying $9 million back. So it's, an, it's over $50 million. The reality is we cannot continue to do what we've been doing. We're going to have to change. And what I mean by that is currently on the sewer side, that's where the sewage and water board taxes increase but there is nothing going on the drainage side. The only people who are paying into drainage are those who are paying property taxes. So if you're exempt, you're not paying drainage, and that's where the infusion of dollars are desperately needed for infrastructure improvement. So we're going to have to do more. And no, not off the backs of the people who are currently paying the taxes, but surely in, in improving this in terms of creating a level playing field so that everyone can put some skin in the game. In addition to that, I will build consensus so that we collectively go to Baton Rouge to get more than just 1.5% of our hospitality taxes. We're going to need more to improve and sustain the infrastructure improvements that are required so that our city can truly be better than it's ever been before. Thank you. Mr. Skurlock. I'm not sure where they got the number 55 million, but quite frankly, I don't trust it. When right after the August 5th floods, when they had the emergency city council meeting, all of a sudden they started throwing numbers up just to fix the catch basins was $35 million to clean that. So once again, I believe we don't need to do a knee jerk. We need to slow it down a little bit, get the right people and go from top to bottom. Water quality, pump stations, pipe replacements, the settlement issues from the streets. Don't forget, a lot of these sewer lines are right underneath all these streets, and most of them are probably pretty cracked, which could be a big reason why we're having so much flooding problem now. It's been a complete failure to maintain any system, and once again, it's from the top down. Let's don't knee-jerk it. Let's do it right. But most importantly, let's have progress and some goals. Let's have it so the constituents can see what is actually happening and in what fashion. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Vassell. Okay, no, we don't need any fees because if you understand, drainage is funded by the ad valorem taxes. We've had a lot of new development in this city. We need to go back and take a look at the roles, and we actually have more dollars coming in. That estimate was done about six years ago when they estimated $55 million. But let me tell you the beauty of drainage and why it's so important to us and why we do need to continue to fund it. What we get from the federal government in a program called SELA, we put up 65% of the, at least SELA puts up 65%, we match it with 35%, and all of the development that you saw on Napoleon Avenue and Jefferson Avenue was funded by those SELA funds. 
So we do need more drainage dollars, but I'm willing to look at what we're collecting from our ad valorem taxes as we continue to build more in this community. There's so much development going on, and as long as we're not exempting them from taxes, we'll have the additional dollars to pay for drainage. Thank you. Okay, Judge Bagnaris. Sewage and Water Board has earned our distrust. They actually, we have been lied to, lied to. First, all the pumps are working. Uh, the, a turbine caught fire. It didn't catch fire. Uh, the, it's safe to drink the water. It's not safe to drink the water. You know, we have, we have just been totally, totally misled. And that is why our government is not, or rather our citizens are unresponsive to the government. We should be because the government has lied to us. And that's what I mean when I say they've earned our mistrust. Now, I'm glad that all my fellow uh, parties here uh, actually agree with me that we need to have unbiased eyes come in and review the system from top to bottom, which is what I said at the beginning. You know, we mistrust it. We need to have unbiased eyes come in and tell us what's going on. No, I would not have any uh, taxes as it relates to the uh, uh, storm fees. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and then the final infrastructure question, we're going to start with Judge Charbonnet. Uh, on major city construction projects, what policies would you propose to better balance quality, time, and cost? First of all, we have to have the proper delivery method for the uh, contract. Um, each, each particular project is going to require a different pro uh, pro program, I should say. You have design, bid, build. You have design, build, construction management at risk. All of that has to be taken into effect. We have to prioritize. I need, I need to take some clarity on the question again. I'm sorry. Um, let me read it again. On major city construction projects, what policies would you propose to better balance quality, time, and cost? Right. So we need to use program managers. Program managers are key. Sewage and Water Board and DPW is not equipped to handle the amount of projects that we have coming forth. There's $2 billion that's appropriated by FEMA. That is a lot of street work. That's a lot of work going on, and we just simply don't have the staff to do that. So we're going to use program managers who have the skills to conduct these programs efficiently. They have the experience. They also have the credibility when it's time to get the reimbursements from FEMA. It's extremely important that we can do that and move these projects along. You need to see progress. You are tired of broken streets. It's time for you to see results. That is what I will give you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Cantrell. Right, now, you mentioned construction projects. Are you? Con uh, street work, big, big city construction Just projects, here. not specifically sewage and water board. Oh, but, okay. Oh. Right, okay. So, one, it really depends on what type of construction projects that we're talking about, about which will determine the processes that you would need to go through. Um, there would need to be an expedited process going through the City Planning Commission. We would need to ensure that projects can get through uh, the different various stages of HDLC or VCC, depending on where they're taking place within the City of New Orleans. Many times these processes hold up progress. They hold up projects, stifling growth and killing projects on the vine. So ensuring that they're able to move forward is essential. In regards to the infrastructure improvements of Sewage and Water Board uh, and contracts aligned with that, we have to ensure that the project um, management within the Department of Public Works, again, pays our people on time. Uh, the uh, contractors are waiting six to eight months sometimes for payment, yet we know we want to do improvements on the DBE program. But again, if the primes aren't getting paid on time, then it really is stifling the growth of our DBEs. So this is about a process across the board. And of course, ensuring on the sewage and water board side, again, with the 2.4 billion that we're expected to receive from FEMA. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, as Mr. Scurlock. To quality, time, and cost, well, the quality, we obviously want the best. There's no doubt about that, but we also have to be realistic. You know, we also, as far as the timing, I don't know what happened, but Uptown New Orleans, they're doing, it seems that everything at the same time on, on Jefferson Street, on Napoleon, on Claiborne, it's all happening at the same time. 
I think we should have limited the contractors and get them to start a project, finish it, then go start another one somewhere else and go on. Right now, so many different streets are broken, so many red lights are out, uh, and it's, it's a Band-Aid. And that, that's what there seems to be no coordination. We have contracts all over the place. And as far as the cost, well, obviously we should go for the lowest bid, but I think there's other things that we, we could work for that. Quite, quite, quite frankly, I think the urgency is so bad in need of street repair that we need to bring in during the wintertime uh, construction companies from up north in Detroit and Chicago and stuff like that because we have an immediate need here to fix our infrastructure. Thank you. Mr. Vassell. Thank you. So here's probably why that question was asked. You guys know the project in the French Quarter that started off at about $6 million that the mayor did not bid out. He merely passed that contract on to a contractor, and it failed. Now it's costing us an additional $3 million. The project is stalled. So when you don't go out for bids for construction contracts, that's what you get. We do have a bid law in place here in the state of Louisiana where you have to bid out these construction contracts. And you have a team there that evaluates those contracts, selects the bidder. The, the law qualifies you and says that you have to select the lowest bidder. You get the lowest, the lowest qualified bidder to do the work, follow up on that, manage that contract along the way. I did $650 million for FEMA. We made sure that we got paid and reimbursed for every dollar that we spent out there. And so I know how to do that. And I will do that on all the construction contracts, make sure that they manage properly, make sure that we get the quality of work that we deserve. Thank you. Judge Bagneris. Obviously on cost, you have to go with the lowest responsible bidder. Uh, and in dealing with the lowest responsible bidder, we have, to, we have to ensure that the monitor is making certain that the bidder is doing the work properly that was bid on. But when you talk about time delays, most of the time delays are actually a result of, in these major contracts, most of the major contracts have a large degree of federal funds, federal and state funds. And in federal funds, there's a lot of reporting that goes on that has to take place before you get the money. Uh, so what I would do is what many other cities are doing is co get a cooperative banks or banks to go ahead and fund the contract so that the contractor has the money, and when the federal funds come in, it goes to the bank. The bank takes out a small portion for the uh, monies that they funded uh, ahead of time to the contractors, but the contractor gets its money on a timely basis. Uh, I, so that addresses the cost and that addresses the time. But when that project is completed, don't do like one contractor did where he was working on dryads, misspelled dryads, I think it was D-R-Y-A-D-D, uh, and he still got paid. We can't settle for that. As a, writer, I, as a writer, I have to say I agree that people shouldn't be paid if they can't spell. But <laughs> um, Mr. Henry, yes. Um, there are two major elements of, um, of changes, that I'll <clears throat> excuse me, changes that I'll make to city government as it relates to performance and contract management. First one is to commit to performance management itself and the standards that go along with it. There are productivity rate structures that have to be put in place, and there are best value models that should be put in place for every single contract that is contracted through city government. The second thing is, is a best practice standard that was developed when I was at IBM that is now being used throughout the industry, most major progressive organizations use, and it is called a project executive project management structure. What is that? You have a single executive with one, the authority, and two, the credentials to shepherd a project from cradle to grave, including the payment process that goes along with it, which is what has destabilized our contractor community. That type of structure is ultimate you know, clarity. It makes it very single point of contact that you know exactly who is doing the work, what state and st step you are in the process, and it's fully transparent. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to economic development now, and we're going to start with Council Member Cantrell on this one. Given the news that Amazon is considering New Orleans as a site for its new facility, what policies can city government take to create a business environment that's attractive to big companies like this and also smaller businesses? Sure. Well, first of all, we have to be a city that doesn't start with no. 
We have to be willing to roll out the red carpet as it relates to attracting economic development and growth to our city. We have to grow to survive. And in order to do that, we're going to have to restructure how we give our incentives in terms of incentivizing development. Currently, the process is, is so politicized, we do not have clear criteria or guidelines uh, to the development community to know exactly how to participate and take advantage of the dollars that we have. The incentives come in many ways, whether it's the economic development millage, the industrial development board, restoration tax abatements, and many others. But again, I call it one-off. Because we don't have clear criteria, it really does stifle growth, or we kill projects in midstream. When we say that we're going to do something, we have to make good on it long term so we can pull off the development that we want. This Amazon is happening at the state level right now, and it is incorporating the GNO Inc. along with other developers that are in the city of New Orleans, and hopefully we can think regionally and take a regional approach in terms of attracting development and growth to the city of New Orleans. Thank you. Mr. Skurlock. Absolutely. It's all about growth. Quite frankly, with our, with our budget of roughly three-quarters of a billion dollars, the only way that we can improve any of these broken city services is new businesses coming here. Quite frankly, I think New Orleans East is the next frontier for distribution, light manufacturing. We need to take advantage of the port. As I mentioned in my opening statement, the reason I'm here is I tried to develop six flags out in New Orleans East. Not only did we want to do that, we wanted to open up an international shopping center, a water park, and a resort hotel. It was going to create more than 10,000 jobs within three years. What I would do is first, we have to restore faith and trust in the city that the national uh, business industries can recognize. And if they come to New Orleans, we need to greet them. We do need to incent them. One thing that I would highly suggest is seeing we have a great convention center, we ought to have a deal with the conventions that come here that we would abate some of the fees for the use of the convention center if, in fact, they opened up an office here in New Orleans. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Vassell. Thank you. So, first of all, I want to tell you that I got appointed by Governor Foster, the head of the state's economic development. I chaired that board for seven of the eight years that I was appointed there. I'm the former CFO for the Chamber of Commerce and Metro Vision, which today is called Greater New Orleans, Inc. When it comes to Amazon, and I spoke to the executive director, the city has a billion-dollar budget. They said the incentives to get Amazon, which has 50,000 jobs, is going to be anywhere from $5 billion to $10 billion to attract a company like that. So you can understand that while New Orleans wants to participate, in order for us to attract a company like that, we're going to have to go to the state to get them to incentivize that company to come here because we don't have the budget to do that. But from a smaller scale, we do have a group called Ideal Village. Ideal Village attracts a lot of medium-sized companies here that we are getting those companies. A lot of tech companies are, are starting to come to New Orleans where we are not needing to provide any incentives to them. So we are doing some things in the economic development area here where we're going to medium-sized jobs and attracting those, but it's, it's more challenging to get the big companies. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Judge Bagnaris. We are the only port in the nation that doesn't do any add-on value to the products that come across the docks. We get more lumber from South America, but we don't have a furniture manufacturer. We are the number one importer of natural rubber. Where's our tire manufacturer? That little cocoa nut that comes all the way across from Africa uh, gets on trucks and rails and boats and goes elsewhere. We can make chocolate. I like chocolate. But we don't, we don't do anything with the, uh, the coconut. Uh, that is a natural for us. You know, now, as Tommy said, on the Amazon aspect, yes, I would go after Amazon, but the only way you can go after Amazon is if you do a regional cooperation. The, uh, the, all of the parishes would have to unite, Jefferson, Orleans, Samanor, Plaquemines, first of all, just to get the numbers that we're talking about with, a, uh, with an entity of that size. But I would still try. Okay, Mr. Henry. Uh, you know, on Labor Day weekend, I was with the CEO of a Fortune 50 company. And I talked to him a little bit about New Orleans and growth. And his message to me was, New Orleans has never been a really relevant city. New Orleans goes after events, not companies. They go after Super Bowls. They go after Final Fours. That's what they do. And that's a challenge for us today. 
because I believe that the reason that we have many of the challenges that we have in New Orleans is we're not growing. Every other major southern city in America today is growing except New Orleans. You can list them yourself. Now, what's Troy Henry's plan? I will bring 40,000 new jobs to the city in New Orleans, and I'm going to do it through the aggressive recruitment of Fortune 1000 companies. I expect to call on 200 of the Fortune 1000 CEOs in my first four years in office. That's one a week. I expect an 8 to 10 percent success ratio based on a customized value proposition that delivers shareholder value to those companies. 8 to 10 percent is 16 to 20 Fortune 1000 companies. It changes the entire complexion and direction of our city. It's the level of growth we need. It's what other major southern cities have been doing for years. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Judge Charbonnet. So there was a New York Times article that discussed why it thought Denver should get the Amazon um, distribution center. One of the biggest reasons is because of its quality of life. It also had a workforce-ready environment so they could lure them there um, and they could get started right away. We have two issues. We have an infrastructure issue. We have a drainage issue. No company is going to come here if they have to shut their doors every time it rains hard. That is just not a good business plan for any company. That is a problem. We've got to get this uh, drainage issue going and, and properly. Secondly, we need a good, strong workforce development program. We have to be able to say that we have these people here ready to start working for you if you so choose to come here. That is two key elements in my opinion. We have got to be able to do that. We have not partnered with our higher education institutions at all. We don't boast that we have graduates coming out of school every six months from universities. We have great community colleges that are producing workforce ready individuals as well. Thank you. And ask everybody. Okay, we're going to move on to city finances now and start with Mr. Skurlock. Uh, the first question is this. The Bureau of Governmental Research estimates that at least two-thirds of real property value in the city is not on the tax rolls and does not generate revenue to provide city services. Many of these properties are owned by nonprofits. Should the state tighten or even eliminate the nonprofit exemption? Well, I think we just figured out why we have a problem at the city, because we don't have any revenue through, going through it, because two-thirds of it is exempt. I think we should absolutely have a complete uh, overhaul. The only thing that I believe should be exempt are active churches that have ongoing services, not that they host weddings at, not that they charge people for things, but it has to be a good reason, a valid reason. I also think there should be some other exemptions for like handicaps and schools, but there's so many different organizations take advantage of it. Obviously, it's come out in the report, and it obviously needs to change. Let me just say that that is a really tough question. And the reason why it's so tough is because when we talk about churches being nonprofits, getting tax exempt, we can also look at Tulane University, Gila University, Xavier, UNO. That's a tough conversation. But I'll tell you what, I'm willing to sit down with them, the archbishop, uh, this church here. You know, we need to sit down because they're absolutely right. They're getting the services of fire, EMS, police, but they're not paying anything. But that's going to be a conversation that we're going to have to sit down with the, with the parties and have that tough conversation because all of these organizations have been exempt for years and years, and it's not only here in New Orleans. It's around the country. I've looked at other places like that. It's the same thing. So that's a tough conversation, but I'm willing to sit down with those in those positions, which means churches, archbishops, rabbis, Tulane University president, Xavier University president. That's a tough conversation, and I'm not going to – over that and tell you that we're going to get that done easily. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Judge Bagneris. Well, first of all, uh, I'm a little bit confused about the uh, two-thirds percent or the 66 per 66 percent uh, being non-taxable uh, because of um, nonprofit status. And the reason why I say that, I checked just this morning, and there is uh, six point three billion dollars of taxable property in Orleans uh, in Orleans Parish total 
And of that total, the assessor has on the books $4.1 billion accessible to be taxed. So that would mean there's only about 30% that uh, would, would fall in that non-taxable status. Now, I know the number comes from the BGR, but it's an old number. So I don't want us to, I don't want us to jump uh, to, to conclusions based on that. And I should say that's, that's non-profit. That's not the entire number. It also includes government properties, but right. the question specifically about Right, right. And as it relates to that, 30% would be too much. You know, any percent... Uh, uh, or that any large percentage of that nature is too much. And the problem is it's constitutionally protected. And uh, I would definitely go after the Constitution, but that means a statewide, uh, statewide referendum would have to occur. Thank you, and I didn't mean to use up any of your time. Uh, Mr. Henry. Um, I believe we need to have a nonprofit rate, which is different than the normal rate. I don't think it should be exempt. I think there should be a discounted rate because they're recognizing their commitment to the community. Simple. Now, what I also believe is that city government needs to lead. And what do I mean by that is, is if we want to generate more revenue, do our job. For example, let's build a mall in East New Orleans that, like it used to generate, $100 million a year in sales tax revenue that today generates little or nothing. But we're not exercising a leadership. We go out and try and treat, figure out ways to suck more money out of you, the citizens, or you, the business owner. And we've had enough of it. So I will lead the charge to, one, reopen Jazzland. Two, build, rebuild the Lake Forest Plaza into a regional mall where we can generate the level of income. Three, rebuild Lincoln Beach. And then four, also have Xavier and Dillard come together to form the fourth African-American medical school and run it out of New Orleans East Hospital. We have to have a better, bigger vision of ourselves. And that's what I plan to do as mayor of New Orleans. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Charbonnet. Yes, I do think the rules should be tightened. I think we should reevaluate the entire application process to see what are the determining factors that uh, qualify you for tax-exempt status. But this gets back to fair share. So I would look at whether the organization is actually fulfilling its intended mission that it says it's going to do when it applies for tax-exempt we don't have enough enforcement in this town. We've got all kind of rules. We've got all kind of applications here that are never really enforced. I can't tell you the laws on the books that I saw in municipal court that were never enforced that would have really benefited you all. Um, so I think it goes back to looking at the intended purpose, and absolutely, people should pay their fair, short, fair share. Thank you. Councilmember Cantrell. Uh, we have to grow to survive. We are a city that's built to handle over 600,000 people, and currently we have 390,000. We have to grow to survive. The burden is on the backs of a few. So, yes, we do have to look at restructuring the nonprofit status of exemption as it relates across the board. A sliding fee scale can be determined based upon the community benefits provided by the organization. I think we have to look at that. We're going to have to change how we do business in our city and who pays into it. Redistricting is coming in 2020. That means that we can lose representation in terms of seats as well as funding from the federal government because we are an urban environment. We have to do things differently. Everyone needs to put some skin in the game, and I would work to ensure that we create a level playing field so we're all in it together. Thank you, and that's everyone. Okay, um, back to Mr. Vassell. Are you currently aware of specific areas of waste in the city budget that you would seek to eliminate? Well, let me, let me just say this. First of all, the city of New Orleans has $160 million that they spend on a police department, but about 1,100 police. Pre-Katrina, we spent about $100 million for 1,400 police. So I think there's money right there that we need to go in there as a CPA. I'm going to go in there and scrub the budget to find out where are those dollars going because we're certainly not getting the police protection that that budget calls for. The other side of it is that we spend 3% of that budget on families, children, and seniors. I think there's a problem right there because... Spending so little on families, children, nor is why we're having so much money being spent on the police department and the fire department and the jail. 
So let me tell you guys, I got appointed by a federal judge to oversee the jail. Since that time, we dwindled the cost of the jail by going in there and being more efficient. And that's what I plan to do in scrubbing the budget, making sure that we're getting the best bang for the buck. Thank you. Judge Bagneris. Well, I'd like to lead by example. So where I would scrub initially, the mayor's office went from 120 employees to 250 employees. Uh, I would start with the mayor's office, period. Mr. Henry. Mike, you're stealing my stuff, but that's all right. <laughs> I would do the same thing. Uh, the, the, the mayor's office is one that, yeah, it's got over, it started eight years ago when I ran it, it had 133 people in it, now it's got 255 people in it. We can start there. But then in addition to that, there's also contractors and contracts that are totally unnecessary that are going on throughout every single aspect of city government. Not only in City Hall, you can go to RTA, you can go to the Sewage and Water Board, you can go to the airport, you can go to every single one of the enterprises, and it is wrought with waste and unnecessary contracts. So we will scrub every element of operations. We will commit to a performance management system so that every single person in city government will have a performance plan. Every single person in city government will actually have to account for their job on a daily basis based on a productivity rate that's going to be established by individual. We're also going to have a courtesy and efficiency standard associated with every single person working in city government. Thank you. Judge Charbonnet, I would start in the mayor's office as well. Um, I don't know that we need this deputy mayor structure. I believe that if you appoint the best people, most qualified individuals to run the various departments that we have within City Hall, then there is no need for the multiple deputy mayors that exist right now. They make good money, very high salaries, and I think that is a waste of money if you've hired appropriately throughout City Hall. Council Member Cantrell. Mm -hmm. uh, on the City Council, I have effectively pushed for a compensation study that's going on right now due to be completed by December of this year. In order for us to right-size government, currently and previously, the current administration would carry over about 200-plus vacant positions. This is where I found a lot of padding kind of going on. That's unacceptable. Those positions either need to stay, be filled, or they need to go away, and those resources redirected to departments so that we can right-size them and get the results that we need to benefit our people on the ground. So this is something that is a big priority, and it's a great opportunity because it's not just right-sizing. It's also going to allow us to pay our people appropriately that work for city government. Clearly, the mayor's office definitely needs to be cut. I'm going to focus on the middle people, people in the middle, because they're the ones that keep government running regardless of who the mayor is and the New Orleans City Council. Okay, Mr. Spurlock. So am I aware of any specific areas that has been wasted money? I personally believe the whole mayor's office and specifically we have a major waste on all the monuments that were just removed. That was ridiculous. Absolutely a waste of thing. It solved nothing. Quite frankly, it divided our city more than anything. Had the mayor listened to what the state was suggesting and put it on the ballot, at least we could have some resolve. That's what we'll have an opportunity to do for this mayor's race. Specific waste, I can tell you what we buy a lot of. We buy a lot of orange cones, and we stick them in potholes. That's another waste. Why don't we just fix the potholes? It's, it's simple, and it all goes leadership. We've got to turn it upside down, and the one thing that was waste it's not really waste. It's that nobody cares. If you go to City Hall, look at the signs on the elevators. It says it's maintained by the City of New Orleans. Anything the City of New Orleans touches is currently broken. Um, on that note, uh, we're going to move. On, we're going to move on to our final main topic area, which is public safety. And the first question is for Judge Bagneris. The New Orleans Police Department currently has 1,167 officers, including recruits. Can the city deploy these officers more efficiently, or does it need to hire more? 
and is the current pay scale adequate to attract new officers? No and no. <laughs> we have uh, that number is much too small. The, uh, there's a study was done in um, early that said our optimum number was 1,600 uh, police officers. So we are about two-thirds uh, of uh, where we should be. And we do not compete with the other, particularly other cities like Houston and Atlanta, in terms of the pay scale, which is why I had already said that I would give a $10,000 uh, raise across the board to police officers because I believe we need to pay po police officers like our lives depended upon it because they do. It's just that simple. And if we have more, if we have a bigger police b department, we'll be able to uh, have a quicker response. We'll be able to have community policing. We'll be ha able to have those things that the public wants to have but needs the numbers in order to do that. Uh, we need to build a police department, and we need to work smarter while we do that by giving them the technological tools they need. Thank you. Mr. Henry. Uh, the, the police department needs to be restructured. Um, just as an example, when I was uh, talking to a couple a couple weeks ago in New Orleans East, they got broken into. Police came 36 hours later. One of my stores got robbed during the Saints game, and we got voicemail when we called 911. There are fundamental issues associated with the police department that exist today. We need more officers. We need boots on the ground. How will I do it? We're going to form strategic alliances with any and every state certified law enforcement agency possible. And we're going to put more boots on the ground by doing that. Second, what we're going to do is every single police officer in our department, including the chief, will have to do one patrol a week. We have to have more physical officers in our neighborhoods. The way you do that is, the th I'm sorry, the third thing is, is we're going to have a strike force. We're going to make life very, very difficult for those bad dudes that are, are, that are consistently wreaking havoc on our communities today. And not only them, but their families. We're going to make it very difficult for them to live in the city of New Orleans. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Charbonnet. We absolutely need more police officers, and no one knows that better than I do, having sat in municipal court and seeing how police officers can't even show up for trial because there's not enough officers out there. That results in cases not being uh, resolved. You need a five-minute response time. That is what I have committed to you, and we cannot get there if we don't have enough police officers. You need to know that the cavalry is on their way when you call in an emergency and you are scared for your life. Now, as my commercial said, if Uber can get you a car in five minutes, why in the world can't we get you a police officer at your door in five minutes? So my commitment to you is that, yes, I will get you more police officers. Yes, I am going to make you feel safer, and they will get to you within five minutes. I guarantee you I'm going to get there for you. You deserve it. Councilmember Cantrell. Um, in regards to the increase in police officers, of course, we do have to grow to survive. And we have to train, change the way that we do recruitment in order to get to the number that we need to be. Currently, 2.6% is what we get from going through the process, and less than 2% actually join the academy. So we're going to have to do a better job with recruitment. And also, in terms of taking the test, if you take the test and you don't pass, you have to wait six months until you can take it a second time. That makes no sense. So we're going to have to retool the New Orleans Police Department, of course, as it relates to recruitment options necessary, absolutely. In terms of pay and pay increase, the New Orleans City Council has increased pay, and we're now on a scale with our sister city. So that is very important. Of course, we need leadership in place in terms of the, to ensure that deployment is where it needs to be. Response times are sufficient to meet the needs of our people. We have work to do, and it does start with leadership and management of the New Orleans Police Department. Thank you. Mr. Skurlock. Could you repeat the question, please? The New Orleans Police Department currently has 1,167 officers, including recruits. Can the city deploy these officers more efficiently, or does it need to hire more? And is the current pay scale adequate to attract new officers? 
We absolutely need more. There's no doubt about it. And we need to have them in the right areas, but we can't neglect some areas. One of the things I'm trying to build a factory out and way out in New Orleans East and Chef Ventura, and there's ba basically no police protection whatsoever. And I'm not quite sure where they are. So what I want to do is get rid of all, all the, the red light cams and um, get the policemen back like they used to out in the public so we can see them. I want to get back the motorcycle policemen, not just for the parades. I want to see them driving around neighborhoods. Once people see them, specifically the criminals, the bad guys, then they'll take it serious. But right now, they're non-existent even when you call 911. So we do need to add technology, not just an Uber to order it, but to give the constituents a number so you feel comfortable when they're going to come. You also can rank what type of service that you need because a large part of the calls aren't an active crime in process. It's a bookkeeping type thing. might be making a police report for an event that already had passed, but at least you have to have confidence that they will eventually show up. Thank you. And Mr. Vassell. The answer is yes to both of those questions. Yes, we can deploy better, and yes, we need more police officers. But there's a group called Forward New Orleans, which is a business group with many, about 26 other organizations. They put out a, a report, and I ask all of you all to go to their website. They said they believe, and these are some experts that put up their own money to find this, that we can hire a net 50 police officers a year, net 50. So they understand how difficult it is to order to hire more police officers. Doesn't mean that we're not going to try, but it is a difficult process because our pool here in New Orleans is not that great. So what we need to do is hire a better recruiter, a better recruiting program. We need to go out and start looking at some of the military people, get them interested in becoming police officers. I do believe right now that the pay is sufficient because it is on a level with the rest of the, the region here. So I think we can do, need to do a better job at recruiting, but as the Forward New Orleans group said, it is not going to be easy to hire 500 or 300 police officers, as some of my opponents have indicated. Okay, and this is the last of our long-form questions, nearing the end here. And we'll start with Mr. Henry, again on public safety. Federal oversight of the New Orleans Police Department is expected to end during the next term. Do you support maintaining its provisions? I'm talking specifically about regulations on off-duty and overtime assignments for officers, restrictions on when and why people can, uh, police can stop people, and the use of body cameras. Body cameras, yes. When and why people should stop, yes. Pay detail policy has devastated the police force. The reason many of these officers have left, we went from 1,400 officers, 1,450 officers when I ran eight years ago to 1,100 is what you're saying we have, but we really got on the streets about 1,060 officers. And the reason is, is we messed their, with their money. So now they all of a sudden used to be able to make a salary plus their details that they did on the side, and now the mayor created this Office of Secondary Employment that screwed over a whole bunch of officers, and what they did was they spoke with their feet. They left. They went to work for the civil sheriffs, the state police, Jefferson Parish. They went other places where they could make the type of money they had been used to making. What I will do is I will restructure their pay detail policy so they can earn the compensation that they got accustomed to and that they deserve. Otherwise, we're going to have to make it up in salaries off your backs. Let the independent business owners like me have the opportunity to hire the officers we want with some restrictions and guidelines, but not this wholesale nonsense that they put in place now that ran our officers away. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Judge Charbonnet? Yes. The consent decree has had some positive effects on the police department, and it does have some negative effects as well. But the Office of Police Secondary Employment has had a deterrent effect on officers and details. They have told me that it's, uh, it is just not even worth it anymore. The city takes $5 off of every hour that they make on a detail, uh, not to mention how difficult it is to, to get the details now. And they've told me how disappointed it is to pull up to a Saints game and see a bunch of Jefferson Parish sheriff's deputies manning these games because it's, just, it's not even worth it for them to go after it. But, you know, it comes to the question of this. So we are on level with the southern average. However, why do officers still need to have these details? So I've asked them, would you rather have a little better salary and not have to work details and have time to spend with your family, or do you still want to do the details? Hands down, I've been told they would rather have 
a hike in salary, have a better life, not have to leave their homes in the evening after they've gotten off of work, and have a full life with their children. So the question remains, do we have to encourage detail for people to make ends meet? Thank you. Council Member Cantrell. The policies associated with the consent decree are right now moving forward through the New Orleans City Council to be institutionalized. So regardless of who the mayor is or who the New Orleans City Council is, these practices will be in place. I think that's important. We will be coming out of the consent decree right around May of 2018. This will be great because we will then be able to reinvest those dollars back into the New Orleans Police Department, but as we, as a city and real leadership, knows how it needs to be done to be more effective. In regards to the Office of Secondary Employment, it is required by the consent decree. However, it has not been managed appropriately at all. That is what turns our police officers off. It is the management and the leadership of the Office of Secondary Employment. I think that our officers really want to be able to choose and do both, work their job, get paid for the job that they're doing, but at the same time, being able to make a little bit of supplemental income if they choose to. Thank you. Mr. Skurlock. Well, I certainly hope we wouldn't have to be continuation on this consent decree, but I've got to tell you, I'm really concerned we're going to have a new consent decree on the Stewart's and Water Board. Because just wait till we get our flood bills from FEMA. This is not, that, that's how bad the situation is. We don't need to put Band-Aids. We need to find the right people, pay them what the fair wage is, that they can live, respect them, give them the, the tools. You can just look at the personalities of the police officers. They want to be led. You know what? Most people want to know what to do. And in this city right now, for some reason, there most people that work at City Hall, in my opinion, it's so micromanaged people won't step up and do the right thing. In the first 30 days that I'm in office as mayor, I'm going to ask any civil servant to write down the way they see what needs to be done for the city because it applies across the board. And my goal is, is to avoid the consent decree, but avoid the new one from FEMA. Mr. Vassal. Sure. Since we're talking about consent decrees, uh, we actually, the city is under three consent decrees. I work on two of them. I, re I renegotiated the con consent decree for the sewage and water board, the sewage only. We have a consent decree. We renegotiated that consent decree after Katrina because it was due to expire. The cities under the police department, that just got extended until 2020. I read that consent decree. That consent decree said that we had the worst police department in the country. So there's a reason why we're under a consent decree. The third consent decree is at the jail. All of both of those, the jail and the sheriff's consent, the jail and the city's p police consent decree dealt with violation of civil rights, of human rights. Police were not treating people fairly. The jail was not treating people fairly. So, yes, we have consent decrees. I think as far as additional compensation for the police officers, yes, I think we can manage that better because we do need our policemen out there. They want to work these details, and if it's managed properly under my administration, we'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Bagneris. The, the, the paid details in and of themselves is not an evil thing. Uh, there are paid details in Jefferson Parish. There are paid details in St. Charles Parish. What brought the problem about was the process or the way our paid detail was being operated. So what we simply do is mimic the same system that exists in the other parishes in terms of paid details. And the officers are fine with that particular situation. How do I know? Because I've spoken to them. Uh, now, as it relates to the other aspects, the cameras and stopping of the citizens, etc., those, I think, needs to remain in place, but not by outside monitors. All we have to do is use our, our own independent police monitor who's here. That's part of her job, to ensure that the police are properly doing their jobs. Thank you. Okay, um, we're now down to the end. We have a few quick questions. Um, ten seconds each, everyone. So, um, and we're going to start with Judge Charbonnet in the first one. 
The question is, would you consider retaining police superintendent Michael Harrison, or are you committed to hiring a new police chief? I have said time and time again that I'm going to conduct a nationwide search for a new chief. However, the chief is welcome to apply, and anybody else that works for the police department has an option to apply. Thank you. Councilmember Cantrell. Uh, definitely national and local uh, search, and given the opportunity to our current chief to apply. Mr. Would, Scurlock. I would definitely find a new superintendent, and I would unlock the handcuffs and tell them to do whatever it takes to maintain public safety. Mr. Vessel. Yes, I would definitely consider the new chief. I think uh, this mayor has had his foot on his neck, and he hasn't been able to do his job, and I would definitely consider him. Judge Bagnero. Like the ladies, I would definitely have a national search, but I would encourage the chief to apply. Mr. Henry. I would do an assessment, and based upon the assessment, I'll make a determination on whether it's this chief or a national chief from somewhere else. Okay. Uh, next, we're going to start with Councilmember Cantrell. Obviously, the big issues in the mayoral race so far have been public safety and infrastructure. Other than those two areas, what topic needs your attention most as mayor? Um, housing, uh, not only affordable housing, but stabilizing our environment, stabilizing our neighborhoods, and improving the quality of life across the board. Mr. Skurlock. Epin economic growth to put a team together and immediately start finding a way to get new industries, manufacturing jobs in the city. Mr. Vassell. I think NORD, I think we need to put more money into NORD, helping improve the system so that our kids are not out here uh, with spare time. Judge Bagneris. Economic growth and jobs. We're the second poorest uh, state in the uh, union. We need economic growth and jobs. Mr. Henry. Uh, economic growth, uh, 40,000 new jobs is priority one. Reengineering city government is the other one. Both of them are acute needs in order for this city to grow and become all that we're capable of being. And Judge Charbonnet. I stand firm that we need workforce development, meaningful workforce development, so that we can attract businesses. So economic development at the end of the day. Okay. You're doing great in being tasked. This is, um, and this is the final question, and we're going to start with Mr. Scurlock. You've already answered it a little bit. Uh, would you support expanding the number of traffic cameras, keeping the current number, reducing the number, or eliminating them entirely? I would keep them only in school zones, and quite frankly, we should rebate any fees that anybody's gotten, because you can't defend against them. Mr. Vassell. I want to eliminate all traffic cameras except in school zones. I have three kids. I want to make sure that my kids and your kids and grandkids are safe as well. But I do want to put up some crime cameras in place of those traffic cameras. Judge Bagner. I would do the same thing with one, one caveat. If we got to keep the cameras, I would take all the money, which is estimated to be $25 million, and put it in neighborhood streets. Mr. Henry. I would, I would um, eliminate all traffic cameras with the exception of school zones. You speed in a school zone, you deserve a ticket. Thank you. Okay. Ju Judge um, Charbonnet. I would certainly leave them in the school zones, but I would want to find out where they've been effective, whether they've reduced accidents in certain areas of the city. It is making up $25 million of the budget. So we do have to figure out how we're going to fill that hole once we take them down. I don't like them. I've had them. I've paid my ticket. Don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating for them. But I do think that um, we could do without them if we can certainly afford to. Okay. And Council Member Cantrell. Um, I definitely would remove the traffic cameras. I organized the transportation working group around schools when Shad Wilson was killed six years old, was killed three years ago. All of the operators were involved in that process, and one, not one recommendation was to add traffic cameras. However, we did focus on safe routes to schools and have a director working in the health department within city government remove traffic cameras, remove the burden off of our people. Okay. And that brings us to the end of the forum. Um, everyone, please, another round of applause for the candidates. <laughs> Just a few very quick comments.
First of all, thanks all five participating neighborhoods. Lake Terrace took the lead on this project, so a special thanks to my neighbors in Lake Terrace who stepped up and helped out. Robert Drum and I probably talked more than my wife and I have the last week. And especially the Lake Area Advisory Council. This is the first of our big projects. We'll be doing others with other neighborhoods taking the lead on them. Uh, thanks to the Hellenic Center for giving us the space. Able Audio, who's our audio company that let us actually hear the candidates from where I was sitting. Our sponsors, design engineers, Lamarck Ford, Linfield Hunter and Junius. The New Orleans Advocate, its owner John Georges, their editor, and most especially Stephanie Grace. She had... <clears throat> She, she worked from our, our issues, but her questions, and I thought she was terrific. Once more, the candidates, thank you all for being here. And finally, our audience. Thanks, everybody. Oh, and the candidates, may be, some of them may be available to talk to you afterwards. We're going to do that instead of a closing comment period. Thanks.